Hello, I'm J.P. Bristow, host of a podcast on the state that, perhaps more than any other, emulated and saw itself as the successor to Byzantium, the Russian Empire. More than the history of the Russians, I tell the story of all the peoples of the empire, from Scythians, Slavs, Rus, Pechenegs and Bulgars, to Poles, Kalmyks, Evenki, Pomors, Mansi and any many others you may never have heard of. Join me in the Russian Empire History Podcast to explore their lives, legacies and identities across this vast and complex territory, from the Arctic wilderness to the Black Sea, from Poland to Alaska, from the birth of steppe nomadism to the modern day. Hello everyone, and welcome to the History of Byzantium, episode 264, questions 11. Several listeners responded to some of the questions we discussed last week. Uh, Dr. Gregory Lippiat, who is a lecturer in medieval history at Exeter University, weighed in on the flying bridges which the Venetians used. He confirms that they were not a new technology, and that the Fifth Crusade would use similar ship-borne towers in their assault on the harbour at Damietta in Egypt. So it's possible that the bridges were brought with the Fourth Crusade, intended for use in Egypt, but proved handy for attacking Constantinople. Dr. Lippiat says that siege equipment was often transported in a kind of flat-pack, easy-to-assemble way uh, when it was being carried a long distance for a specific purpose like this. A couple of listeners also commented on the question of the wind blowing the Venetian ships into the seawalls. Listener LD and EP both point out that ships will be blown in some direction by the wind, regardless of whether they have sails or not. Listener EP talks about ships usually avoiding being blown onto the lee shore, as in the shore which the wind is naturally pushing them towards but in this case they would have embraced it, while listener LD uses the modern example of the Ever Given, a container ship with no sails that got stuck in the Suez Canal in 2021 after heavy winds shoved it into the bank. Thank you all for your feedback. On to new questions. Several listeners asked about reactions to the sack of Constantinople. How did the rest of the Christian world react? How did the Islamic world report the news? How did the church perceive what had happened? With most of Byzantine history, we don't have instant reactions available. We don't have many documents or letters or bulletins. We have a sense of how events were perceived, but for the vast majority of happenings, we only have a report written in a history book. And often these tell us the gist accurately, but they are usually written years, decades, or even a century after an event happened, by when the event has been absorbed into a narrative about what took place. This is just how humans function and how history is written. Histories are rarely dry collections of facts, but an interpretation of what a series of events mean. With the Fourth Crusade, we're actually very lucky to have good sources for the immediate reaction of contemporaries, because the conquering Latins felt the need to write home to justify what they had done. We also have the good fortune to have Coniates on hand to give us his raw emotional response to the sack. And because he was near the end of his life, his history preserves those bitter feelings. Had he been a young man, and written decades later, he might well have recontextualized the sack as the beginning of a different story rather than the end of one. Unfortunately, we don't have this same trove of resources when it comes to the reaction of other states and peoples. Their histories fall into the traditional trap of being written later on when the context of the sack had changed in their minds. For example, the Byzantines will retake Constantinople in 1261. So for those writing history in, say, 1280, the Latin capture of the city could be viewed as an aberration, a blip in the normal order of things. 
whereas those writing in 1250 were much more circumspect about what it all meant. It's also worth saying that most history books don't mention events taking place in neighbouring states, unless they are particularly significant, which the sack of Constantinople was, but its exact significance was not clear. So several Islamic historians do mention the sack. The most detailed narrative comes from Ibn al-Athir, who lived in Mosul in northern Iraq. Despite a few mistakes, his reporting is very good, which suggests that he had a well-informed source from the Seljuk world. The most interesting detail is the claim that the Romans did ask the Sultan of Iconium for help during the siege. Most likely, this appeal would have come from Alexius Ducas, as in Mordsuflos. If true, it would suggest that in the months before the final siege, the emperor wrote to the sultan asking him to send troops. Which is entirely possible, since the two monarchs were on reasonable terms, and a company of step archers would have been super useful at that moment. Unfortunately, the sultan was still dealing with his rebellious relatives, and it's not clear if the Byzantines would have been able to ferry the nomads across the Bosphorus. Anyway, Ibn al athir doesn't really pass comment on the significance of this event for the Islamic world. He's far more concerned with the Latins of Utremir. Later historians either copy his account or make short mention of it. Abu Sharma mentions that the Latins sold Byzantine marble uh, within Utremir. Uh, while Ibn Kathir is the only one who sees the sack of a Christian city as a definitely good thing. The reality is that the sack didn't mean a lot to the Islamic world. It wasn't an event which had a direct impact on their lives, and only Ibn al-Athir's history was published during the period of Latin occupation. All the other writers knew that the Byzantines would get the city back. It's also worth saying that the event didn't really fit into a wider Islamic narrative. The idea that one day Constantinople would fall to a Muslim army was part of the swirl of Islamic thought about the future, but an inter-Christian dispute over Byzantium did not. That sense that a Latin army capturing Constantinople didn't really fit with established visions of the future is apparent in other works. The Armenians of Cilicia didn't have a contemporary chronicler for us to check, but Armenian ecclesiastical writers are focused on the destiny of Armenia and didn't see a Latin-Byzantine conflict as a significant part of that. While Bar Hebraeus, a Monophysite bishop from Syria, follows the Islamic line, seeing 1204 as a sideshow and not a significant or even a particularly sad event in the history of the Levant. The people for whom the sack was most relevant, the Seljuks, have left us no written accounts, save for the details they passed to Ibn al athir The Turkic peoples knew all about what had happened and which parts of the empire were now under Latin rule, but no further opinion was expressed to posterity. In Utremir, we don't have an immediate response, but soon afterwards it becomes clear that the Latins there view the capture of Constantinople as a bad thing. One chronicler does condemn the Crusaders for their sins, but it seems that he's less concerned with the damage done to Byzantium than the damage done to Utremir. The foundation of a Latin kingdom on the Bosphorus was clearly going to drain men and money away from Jerusalem, which it did. We find Pope Innocent III in a similar mood. His initial response was very positive, since the capture of Constantinople was an amazing feat which seemed to indicate that God still supported the crusading movement. However, he soon realised that not only was this new kingdom going to seduce men away from the Holy Sepulchre, but it was also ignoring his authority when it came to ecclesiastical policy. The Pope soon began to criticise the crusaders for their sinful behaviour during the sack, though historian Michael Angold believes that this was something of a useful stick which the pontiff could beat them into line with. If there was outrage in the Rus or Georgian worlds, I haven't come across it yet. 
Rus travellers would continue to come to Constantinople for the next few centuries, viewing the city as a holy place that had not been delegitimized by the sack, while the Georgians used the weakened state of the empire to expand their realm down towards Trebizond. Again, I think the inter-Christian nature of the conflict diluted the response that might have come if Constantinople had fallen to a Muslim power. I think the contemporary Latin reaction is nicely summed up by Arnold of Lübeck. He was abbot of the Monastery of St. John at Lübeck in Germany, and writing a few years after the sack, he complimented the Crusaders for their achievement, but added, whether they were the deeds of God or of men, a fitting outcome is not yet in sight. Though the Byzantine reaction has been elucidated by Coniates, listeners asked where the Patriarch was during these disasters. The Patriarchate of Constantinople has been somewhat muzzled by the long reign of Manuel Komnenos. Manuel took a very active role in ecclesiastical affairs during the latter part of his reign, and the dominance of the imperial office showed during the collapse that followed his death. You may recall that the sitting patriarch resigned rather than lead the church in opposition to Andronicus's reign of terror, while Isaac Angelos, hardly an imposing figure, ended up hiring and firing prelates at a surprising rate. He had five different patriarchs during his nine years on the throne the most spirited of whom was Dosithios, the man who preached strongly against the Latins during the passage of the Third Crusade. When Isaac got rid of him too, it rather stifled the anti-Latin party amongst the clergy, who might have been in a position to rally the populace against the Fourth Crusade. The bishop on the patriarchal throne when the siege began was John Kamatiros, an old man by this point and a political appointee, he was the brother of the empress, Irene Dukaina Kamatira, meaning he was Alexius Angelos Komnenos's brother-in-law. He was therefore in a very weak position when A.A.K. fled and his nephew took the throne. When the city was sacked, Kamatiros headed for Thrace, as Coniates did, where he would die a couple of years later. So sadly, the leader of the Byzantine church was as passive as the emperors were during this crisis. Finally, on this topic, listener R.G. asks whether anyone saw the fall of Constantinople as a biblical sign indicating the end of the world was nigh. The broad uh, answer ends up being no, because of what we've discussed before, as in the fact that the Latin Empire would eventually fall um, rather weakened the sense that something apocalyptic had taken place. But that doesn't mean people at the time felt that way. We don't have access to the thoughts of people on the ground very often, but we do get apocalyptic writing from across the centuries, and the most enduring tale in the Roman world had been created centuries earlier. This was written by an author we know of by the name Pseudo Methodius, a Christian living in Syria under Islamic occupation in the 690s. So about 50 years after Heraclius died and the caliphate formed, um, it was clear at this point that Christian rule wasn't coming back, but it wasn't clear what that meant. Pseudo-Methodius predicted that a final emperor would one day come to lead the Christian people to victory over Islam. He would conquer Jerusalem, ushering in the end of the world. This idea was so popular that it reappeared in dozens of other apocalyptic texts across the generations. Each new version updating certain pieces of information to fit the political circumstances of their own day. Obviously, when Pseudo-Methodius wrote, he imagined an emperor of Constantinople coming to Jerusalem. But over time, Western European writers had come to imagine that it might be one of their own a Charlemagne or a Frederick Barbarossa, who could fill that role. In some of these traditions, Constantinople does fall to this Western army as part of the journey to the Holy Land. Such ideas were only sharpened by the era of crusading, and may well have been part of the reason that so many Byzantine writers believed that the Latins' real goal was to eliminate them en route to Utremir. 
In the days after the sack, then, many clearly would have viewed the loss of Byzantium as a precursor for major events to come. Something quickly picked up on by those who told the Latins that the Theodosian columns in Constantinople depicted the coming of the Crusaders and the sack of the city, an incident I mentioned last episode. This was not a perspective which the Byzantine elite indulged in. They were keen to begin a counterattack and focused their energies on retaking Constantinople. The Romans at Nicaea would double down on their sense that they were a chosen people a new Israel, an idea which has been present in Byzantium since the days of Justinian. They had been thrown out of their own city, like the Jews who were taken to Babylon, on account of their sins, and they must now win God's favour in order to return to their promised land. But uh, more on that when the narrative resumes. Listener TTF asks why I use the term Latins to refer to the Crusaders. Was the term used by the Byzantines at the time, or even before the Crusades? The Byzantines did indeed use the term Latinos, or Latinikos, and then modern historians have picked up on that, and I imitate them. The term was used occasionally before the Crusades, but obviously it was the arrival of a mass of Westerners in the Byzantine Empire that forced the Romans to come up with a term to denote all men of the West, rather than referring to them as Franks or Germans or Normans. It was Anna Komnini who popularised this in terms of history writing, and Coniates follows suit. Once the Latins were a feature of life in Byzantium, their commonalities had been noticed, and so Byzantine writers could refer to Latin habits or Latin dress and so on. Before that, the terms Franks or Celts had been used to refer to Westerners in general, but otherwise people were noted as being from distinct places, Italians, Spaniards, Germans, and so on. Listener TTF also asks whether the Latins spoke to one another in Latin, only the most educated would have been able to do this, churchmen, certainly, and maybe some of the nobles, but in general, no. People spoke in their own dialects, and on crusade had to find interpreters to communicate between groups. Several crusader historians talk about this, and how there were many people on their own pilgrimages that they couldn't understand. Listener T.O.L. says, As well as physical items, did the Latins also steal craftsmen? I've seen at least one report saying that the Venetians forcibly relocated Roman glass blowers to Venice and that these families became the core of those who would be ensconced on Murano Island after 1291. I can see this claim online, usually related to Murano glass products. It hasn't come up in the reading I've done. We do know that when the Normans sacked Greek cities, they targeted artisans in this way, so it's certainly possible. And perhaps this happens after the sack itself, um, but as I say, I haven't come across it yet. Listener LW asks, did the Byzantines have any recorded thoughts or opinions on the Latin holy orders, such as the Templars and Hospitallers? Sadly, I haven't been able to find any direct comment on the orders themselves, but I have found an interesting debate going on within Byzantium itself about people who take holy orders, or indeed priests, um, taking part in battle. In the Roman world, the church had always kept its employees away from bloodshed. Priests were forbidden to take part in war, and battle was left to the secular authorities. In the Latin world, this was different even before the Crusades, since clergymen were often local landowners and administrators. So at times, there were bishops who were the ones in position to gather an army and even lead them into battle at the request of their feudal lord, um, you know, the king or the emperor. Doubtless, many Byzantines were shocked when they heard that men were taking holy orders who would then spend their lives killing people. Not that that was the primary intention of those orders, obviously, but the longer the two sides interacted, the more you get the sense that the, that the Byzantines grudgingly admired the Latins. Their religious conviction you know, was so strong and their organisations were so robust that it brought into question some of the more sluggish institutions of Romania. 
Manuel Comnenos certainly gave tacit support to these orders as part of his pro-Western policies. Constantinople housed a hospital run by the Knights of St. John, or the Hospitallers, as they were also known, and the Templars listed New Rome as the site of one of their establishments. We also know that members of these orders negotiated directly with the emperors when both the Second and Third Crusades passed by. It's been argued by some that the Hospitallers based their establishments on the Hospitals of Constantinople. Certainly the organisation of both um, in terms of written charters is similar and the Byzantine institutions were much older than those in the West. It's also interesting to note that anecdotally we do hear of Byzantine priests joining in uh, with fighting. Uh, Eustathios of Thessaloniki says his staff joined in the defence of the city during the Norman sack. Coniates proudly claims that a relative of his, a deacon, joined in the looting of Turkic territory um, during one campaign, while a Genoese writer who marched across Anatolia with Manuel says that Byzantine priests had to fight the Turks in distant forts because of a lack of manpower. So the theory of canon lawyers that priests in Byzantium never shed blood was clearly tested by the needs of a frontier society, which doubtless meant that many Romans understood exactly why the Templars and Hospitallers had to fight to protect pilgrims in Utremir. After the establishment of the Latin Empire, both orders would receive Byzantine lands as gifts to help fund their work, and it seems that both were asked to militarily occupy certain castles in Greece. Listener KH asks, could you explain in more detail how the Latin and Byzantine churches were different at this time? I know that the liturgies are really different today in Catholic and Orthodox services, but I don't have much understanding of how those things diverged over time, from, say, the Council of Nicaea to the sack of Constantinople versus the sack to now. That's a deep question, and I'll talk more about the latter part in a moment. Sticking to 1204, my reading suggests that there were basically three things which really bothered the Byzantines about Latin practices, and then a whole laundry list of smaller issues which were less of a problem but could be brought out to berate the Latins uh, with <laughs> when needed. The three major ones were the filioque the use of unleavened bread in the Eucharist, and papal supremacy. We've talked about the filioque before. Uh, in the creed agreed at the First Council of Constantinople, the Holy Spirit is said to proceed from the Father. But a few centuries later, the Latin Church added the phrase, and from the Son. This was an innovation which the Orthodox did not approve of, and there was lively debate about the theological implications and meaning of this. I think we've talked about the bread before as well. Um, the Byzantines associated unleavened bread, bread made without a rising agent like yeast, with the Jewish commemoration of the Passover. So in the Eucharist, Christ was remembered with leavened bread, as in bread that would look like the bread you make a sandwich or a roll out of. Um, it differentiated the Christians from Jewish practice and had associations with Jesus rising from the dead. The Latin use of unleavened bread in the Eucharist was therefore seen by many as an error. Finally, papal supremacy was a real sticking point when it came to any hope of church union. Historically, the Byzantines pointed out um, that no bishop, not even the patriarch, had been head of the church. The five leading archbishops were meant to come together at ecumenical councils to make decisions together. Uh, but, you know, practically, if the Pope's word was final, then all these Latin errors could just be imposed on the Orthodox, which was intolerable. And papal supremacy was uh, <laughs> a non-negotiable for the Popes at this point. Beyond the big three, though, certain Byzantine clergymen did make lists of Latin errors, some of which are very long. They include things like uh, fasting on the wrong days, eating unclean foods, not allowing priests to marry, counting the days of Lent incorrectly, baptizing incorrectly, allowing marriages that should be prohibited within extended families, monks eating lard, 
failing to revere icons, a lack of reverence for the Virgin Mary, making the sign of the cross incorrectly, priests not having beards, and so on and so on. Um, it's clear that lots of these differences were sort of cultural rather than doctrinal, and at a high level, many bishops and emperors over the centuries had concluded that most of these differences were immaterial. But the more the Latins penetrated Byzantine society, the more um, the acute these differences became, and the more the Orthodox debated which of these practices were acceptable or not. A pressing question, presumably, because some Byzantines were drifting into Latin practice. Taken as a whole, um, these long lists suggest that a great deal of difference had developed between East and West since the Council of Nicaea. But the fact that church union was pursued repeatedly and charges of heresy were rarely formally presented implies that they were not as far apart as they might seem. Obviously, a lot has changed between 1204 and today. I once referred to people in the pews in Constantinople, demonstrating my ignorance of church services in the medieval period, since pews would not arrive in Catholic churches until the 14th century and are still absent from many Orthodox churches today. Um, church history is the topic where I am most often corrected by listeners, even this brief discussion may have brought me further into disrepute. I have tried in the past to interview um, experts on the liturgy, but I've struggled to find someone who can explain things simply to a modern, non-religious audience. Um, I know some of you are very interested in this topic, and some of you have no interest in religion at all. I would certainly like to gain a better understanding of the church, uh, particularly how it featured in the everyday life of a Byzantine person. So let me know if you'd like me to investigate this topic in more detail, and indeed if you know of any experts who are very good at communicating to a modern secular audience. Um, I have had some kind suggestions already. That's all the questions for today. I will see how I get on this week. If I can answer another round of questions, then it will be more questions in our next episode. But if I don't have time, then we'll turn to Anthony Caldellis for his top 10 emperors. Oh, I'm still excited just to re-listen to that episode uh, when I come to edit it. While you're waiting for those episodes of the History of Byzantium, why not check out the Russian Empire History Podcast? If you want to know more about the Third Rome and how Byzantine culture influences the development of the Russian world, then check out J.P. Bristow's show. There's a thorough introduction to the history of the region, which should take you nicely from the brief snippets I've given you about the Rus into the eventual formation of the Russian Empire itself. Find out more at the Russian Empire History Podcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs> <laughs>